Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So we're talking right now um, about a series called See It to Be It, and this is an interview series for Living Corporate. And I just wanted to ask you some questions, if I may, about your industry, how you got there, and kind of what you're working on. Absolutely. Okay. So first of all, you work in the insurance industry. And I was wondering if you can tell me how you got involved in that industry and what about it appealed to you. I don't think many kids sitting at home at five or six years old, when someone says, what do you want to be when you grow up? They typically don't say, well, I want to work in insurance. <laughs> so I, like many other kids, had aspirations of being an astronaut, professional athlete. Um, that a veterinarian was primarily what I wanted to be growing up. I had pursued through high school. Um, with the intent to go into UC Davis since it was the number one agricultural school. Went through that program, quickly found out that I was way behind the curves of other students, being that I grew up in a suburban area. I wasn't on a farm 24 seven. I wasn't part of 4-H clubs. So when I saw a cow, others saw a ribline, bovine, you know, some kind of breed that I did not. So I quickly realized that, that was not the path for myself. Um, now, fortunately, some, through some events that happened, I found myself in communications. And as anyone will tell you, it's sort of like basket weaving for college students. It was a way to finish a degree. I'm, I'm just being blatantly honest with it. Mm -hmm. um, so leaving that particular um, des degree, let me put it that way, I got actually into the financial market. Uh, long story short, just like anyone else in the insurance profession, we all tend to fall into it rather than to intend to go into it. So I had been on the West Coast, born and raised, finished my education in uh, Sacramento. I was working for an IRS tax firm, really not going anywhere. A friend of mine showed up at my door. I came out and visited him in New Jersey, made a joke that saying, if things are going anywhere in a year, I'll come out here. Year to the date, he shows up at my door. Things weren't going anywhere. Packed up. Five days later, I'm on a train ride, and I'm in the East Coast starting from square one. I went in, do I went in my bread and butter. Started as a CSR for Commerce Bank. Uh, and CSR is? A customer service representative. So I'm that face that would help you open loans, close accounts, uh, answer those troubling questions that you would have regards to where your money is going. Okay. Uh, and then I was approached by an insurance company, one I had never heard of, but everyone in the area uh, said it was highly rated in New Jersey. Um, so I ended up taking a chance, going into this unknown profession. But So to answer your question for insurance, what attracted me to it and why I fell into it, it was sort of like that Wizard of Oz parody where you know that we need it, it's existed, but you want to know what's going behind the curtain. So this was the opportunity to see behind that curtain and the inner works and what that industry really meant. But which you're right, most young professionals looking at the industry are just seeing the curtain. They're seeing this large conglomerate, nothing really behind it, no really example in contrast to, you know, those sports athletes or astronauts or public figures that we all saw as kids. So obviously there's no real attraction. There's no symposium of all-stars and in insurance, not yet at least, not yet. Um, that, that are attracting people to the field. No, that's fantastic. So can you tell me a little bit about your journey? Because insurance as an industry, and I didn't know this until I worked in it, but insurance as an industry has so many different functions. Um, and can you just tell me a little bit about your journey and what functions you've um, you've been a part of and what roles that you've held in the insurance industry? Sure. So when I teach students about insurance, I treat insurance like a tree. At the bottom are the roots, the things that are status quo across the board, which is primarily your customer service positions, those being um, your brokers, agents, those the lobby voices at the other end of the line if you call with a problem with your insurance policy. And that's, in essence, where I started. So I, I felt that if I was going to understand an industry, I wanted to start from the mail room, hypothetically, and work my way up. So I spent five years in the personal lines, which is your auto, home insurance, your non-commercial exposure side of insurance for the primary beginning of my, my stint in insurance itself. And then that transition and seeing after a while that there were different avenues, such as underwriting, that group that looks at the risks and determines whether or not we're going to insure them. The claim side. This is your post-loss team, that sort of uh, Johnny on the spot, let's jump in, 
let's react and put the insured all better. And then there's other avenues as well. And it was the claims aspect that provided me the most immediate entry. Now, ironically enough, I wanted to be in the auto side, the physical damage portion. Someone gets involved in an accident, their vehicle gets damaged. Let's fix the vehicle, get them back on the road. Because that's what's in the most reasonable, most understanding insurance-wise. Like, I know what a car is. I should be able to do that job. Um, the reality is I actually ended up in the personal injury protection portion. So this is the portion where in the event, it's not the car that gets hurt, but it's the individual. And it's a particular area of claims that not only takes the know-how and knowledge as far as what happens in our loss, but the empathetic side that goes along with the human component. Yes, we all have attachments to the tangible items as far as our vehicles, but nothing's more tangible and more precious to us than the lives of ourselves and the lives of our passengers. So that was a big turning point as far as discovering who I was and where I wanted to be. So obviously the way it usually works in insurance is that you're thrown into the trenches after some minimal training because the best teacher, unfortunately, in claims is the calls themselves. So my my tale to fame is my very first call as a personal injury protection adjuster was a mortality claim. So no tougher spot to be in as far as an empathetic side than a loss of somebody in a motor vehicle accident. I mean, there's variant extremes for your simple neck and backs. Everyone who's ever been involved has soreness 72 hours later, but this is one of those rare circumstances where somebody actually lost their life during this. So this was, here's, here's the pool. We're throwing you in the deep end kind of scenario. And I came out of it thinking like, this is really what I want to do. It's not it, take assurance out of the equation. It was the same thing as the, the basis of why I wanted to be a veterinarian. It was coming to the aid of those, be it animals or humans that were in need of aid, giving them the resources to walk them through, to get them back to where they could, if you could. And if not, be there for those that are affected by it and let them get into a spot. Now, not everyone's going to walk away the same. I'm not going to be able to get them all mostly correct, but if I can make the process itself as easy as possible, especially when we're in an industry that don't know us, we're just this large conglomerate who takes their money and tries hypothetically to shortchange them on the, on the, on the front end side. It's something we're all as professionals right now are trying to battle because the biggest thing, as I'm sure you're well known now moving into the upcoming generation is transparency. That is the big push. Everyone wants to see behind the curtain. Everyone expects to see behind the curtain. And if you're able to put that forward, there's somewhere else that can. I think it's interesting how you, you stayed within the financial services industry because that's really where insurance is. It's, it's transfer of risk. Um, but you were able to use your communications major, right? Your, um, this kind of grounding and empathy and interpersonal relationships to be successful within the financial services industry. Correct. Exactly. So any service industry that we get into, the most important skill that I can tell anyone is the communication portion. Yes, I make fun of it saying it's the basket weaving of degrees, but in actuality, every core interaction has some component of communication, be it verbal, nonverbal, electronic. That is a core curriculum, a core component that will never disappear. It may change shape, it may look by a different beast, and we may travel by different means, but that at its core is one of the most important things that someone can learn. And it is not an innate skill. Some may pull it off and make it seem like it's an innate, because as you and I know, we've said some very fantastic speakers, but everyone has the ability to communicate in some way or matter, manner, excuse me, and be the best they can be to convey that message, regardless of what field they're in. I love that. And it speaks to um, the notion of transferable skills. So I think a lot of times people find themselves in maybe an industry or a company or a position that they're not, they don't feel fulfilled. Uh, similar to how you felt being an IRS, um, was an IRS auditor? So I was actually the, 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 the paper pusher. So I would receive those that had back tax liens I would be the person filling out all the paperwork to transition to the attorney who would then do all the litigation portion. So it was that okay, in between so go over stage. Gotcha. So, but you had, you had a role that you weren't fulfilled and you were able to take some transferable skills and take that to another role in another industry and really make that work for you. 
Exactly. And I think that's phenomenal. I, I think that for me as a first generation college student, I didn't understand um, the nature of transferable skills. I didn't understand how, um, you know, a, how a communications major, for example, might prepare you for a job in insurance um, or how, you know, a, um, you know, any type of degree might, any type of liberal arts degree might translate to something that wasn't specific to that degree. So I think it's important, especially for young people who are first generation students um, who maybe don't have an example to follow of someone that they know personally, um, that they understand, right, that there's so much more out there. And if your degree is criminal justice or sociology or humanities or English, you have so many skills that people need pretty much anywhere in the economy. It's just a matter of finding the right role and the right, um, and the right culture. One of my mentors, I've had many along the way that have been great and impactful, but the one that made the greatest impact told me a very simple statement when it came to us as persons. Take every opportunity to learn a new skill. That school in itself becomes a tool in which you put in your toolbox. A toolbox that no one can take away from you and then you can always call upon regardless of the situation that you're in. And that particular mentor was my mother. She was mm -hmm. uh, in the field of education. I grew up playing Oregon Trail. I was in, immersed in the educational system. Um, she being a Hispanic female, single mother, um, in an industry, yes, most teachers were female at that time, but most of them upper management were not. Uh, she continually strived to break that barrier, being in various roles from superintendents to summer school schools, all in a means to, to break that. And, and the emphasis was that they can never take education away from you. It was the, her main line. And as you can tell, being that I'm a doctor, that sort of steadfast and that came the same. The, the, the reality is everything we learn, be it formal education, be it the mentorship that we take from someone else, and be it something that we look up to and idolize and can take components of what they're successful with, are all tools that we can put in our own toolboxes to carry with us wherever we go. We may not find that somewhere initially is fulfillful, I mean fulfilling, but we might find something there we can put in that toolbox and take us somewhere else. I absolutely love that, and I have used that analogy countless times as a manager, as a leader, as a mentor, as a coach. <laughs> More tools for your toolbox, even if you don't need it. Um, I read a I read the uh, memoirs of Steve Martin a couple years ago, and he has just he's just lived an incredible life, of course. And he was a philosophy major in college, which you know is another one of those basket weaving sort of uh, majors that a lot of people think of. That was but, the elective. What's that? <laughs> so that was the elective. Yes. <laughs> and so he, uh, you know, he, but he he learned how to think. And one of the things that one of his mentors told him um, was, "You'll use everything you've ever done." And so, you know, when he was, I think he started, um, his first job was at Disneyland and he was selling like uh, trick lassos. And he said, and then later he was in a movie, uh, Three Amigos, where he had to use the lasso and he knew how to do it because he had done that before. And he's found that that's true, right? That you'll use everything you've ever done. And I think the way you said that about you have these tools in your toolbox, no one can take them away, is the flip of that. You can only use everything you've ever done if you've done those things. Right? Exactly. So you have to build those, those skills and that muscle memory. And all the bumps and bruises that go along with them. Absolutely. So um, I want to ask you, first of all, since you mentioned that you're a doctor, can you tell me a little bit about um, what uh, – what prompted you to pursue a PhD and what your PhD is in? Sure. So my PhD or my doctorate is in business administration with emphasis on project management. Um, now this goes into the core of what we've been discussing. I mean, in the fact that yes, being a person of my ethnicity and to answer your question, it is Samoan and Mexican, a very unique mix. Um, there are common bears such as my mother experienced going through her, um, time in the professional field. And what I found, a way to mitigate that and to, in essence, remove that barrier is to specialize. The more we can invest in yourself and specialize in a niche, one that will hopefully be personal to you, removes 
those ambiguities, those biases that may be associated in pools where there's greater amount of people. So an emphasis for me, pursuits of education did three things. One, it fulfilled a goal that my mother, myself and my mother had and always to obtain our doctorate. Two, it became a, a leading expert in my field because in education and curriculum, a, a doctorate is the pinnacle of achievement. Three, I can apply the project management skills to my current position. Um, I have since changed since the first company I ever worked with, but now I'm building my own personal injury protection department on the basis of what I've experienced throughout my career thus far. So going upon the education that I have gives me basis as far as curriculum to help build this new department in light of everything I saw as an issue and everything that I want to address moving forward. So it, everything sort of caps and builds upon itself, but the underlying theme along it all is finding a way to specialize in a unique field to make me an expert, not an expert of minority, not an expert um, non-minority, just an expert in this particular field. That's fascinating. And I, I think the, um, so many of us who are, um, different or who, who at least perceive ourselves as being different or outside of um, the dominant uh, culture or the dominant leadership paradigm uh, tend to rely on education and certifications and sort of um, more tangible um, testaments to our abilities and skills um, sort of as a uh, almost a um, as a compensation for that difference. And so, you know, you talk about things that people can't take away from you. Um, I think that that mentality itself comes from a place of difference. I don't know that, you know, I think for some people they feel it's their birthright to be um, respected as leaders in business or respected as leaders in their profession and not um, maybe not have to go to such great lengths to prove those capabilities on the front end. Which I could agree with. I believe that, you know, the certification, the certifications, education, um, part of it is social because it's coming to a, everyone moves through. We all have that connotation that if you go through a higher education, you'll come out earning more money at the end. It's sort of, it's how the industry works. We go from one end to the other, but then on the same hand, there's the disparity of the two tracks. There's the person who's going because they were told to go and they already know at the end is going to be successful regardless of what they do. And those that know they're going to face a struggle when they do get out of that education area where they have to be now compared with these others and say, how am I different? How can I show that I have the ferocity to put all I have? And that's where the certifications come into play. Now, in, you know, just like in verbal communication, we all have hedges. We'll say disclaimers like, I don't want to offend you, but you know, we put these buffers in order to protect ourselves. The same thing with certifications. We know we're competent in these skills, but without that tangible piece of paper or item, it's maybe just a subjective item that they can persuade or pass off. But if I walk in and say, I am a CPCU, I have this giant placard to go with it, that's something they can't easily push by. They can't say, well, you know, you sort of have those skills, but you don't. No, here is an institution on its own telling me that this person has been granted these. So... Yes, and the CPCU, I think, for those who don't know, is a, a, a chartered property casualty underwriter designation. It's a, a very prestigious um, award that requires you know, significant study um, and passing, I think it's eight exams right now um, in the insurance industry. It's a lot of people liken it to a master's degree in insurance. They do. I think entry level, you could say the initial component is people looking to distinguish themselves from others, especially those of color, because they're finding ways to combat the other side of the coin, in essence. Um, and that transitions, hopefully, as it did with myself, is that then you start to fall in love with what you're doing, and now the pursuits are not as a means to distinguish yourself or make yourself an expert again, making yourself that niche where you are the one-stop shop when everyone has an issue regards to that particular subject matter. Absolutely. And I think, too, you know, going back to what you said about the, the ability to learn and have that mindset of constantly learning, that continual growth mindset, is in and of itself a skill, right? Resilience is a skill. And for people to cultivate that over time, regardless of where they come from, what they look like, or how other people perceive them, those skills are invaluable. 
because that's what gets you up the next day or, you know, um, when you hit a setback, it's what keeps you from just staying down. And when people see that, um, they ascribe other leadership traits to you as well, because they see that you are resilient, that you are constantly learning, that being an expert isn't enough for you. You have to be, you know, it, it's not just about expertise. It's about expertise and application or expertise and application and paying it forward. And I think so many of the people that I admire as leaders, they have that constant, um, they're constantly striving for additional mastery, additional, um, you know, additional expertise to learn the next thing, to keep moving forward in their careers and then to bring others with them along the way. You're absolutely right. I mean, life will give you plenty of opportunities to give up. It's just the way life goes. It'll give you plenty of opportunities where you could throw in your hat in and no one would turn or bat an eye. They'd be like, oh, that's understandable. That happened. I mean, we all have those life-changing moments, be it significant or not, that we could just say, okay, that's it. We're done. But it's how the resilience of every, any person to get up, dust themselves off, and for to get back on the horse is a testament to them. Absolutely. So let me ask you, what's the biggest thing that surprised you about the insurance industry once you were in it? the maze that is the insurance interest. So as I told you, I wanted to see behind the curtain. And what I found, more curtains. Um, as, as you alluded to, the insurance industry is a blanket term for this giant maze that professionals navigate in different extremes. At each turn, there's two more turns. At each U-turn, there's another turn coming. Um, the, the blatant way to put it, is every day is different. If you're looking for the bottom of a hole, I'm unfortunately gonna tell you this is not the industry you're gonna find the bottom of that hole. You're gonna find another hole. Uh, and that's what's so interesting and engaging in the industry is that you will gain so much during the discovery that it'll just keep you coming back for more. Um, I, I see, let's kind of link it to the euphoria that, you know, not to say, so our first responders, they rush in. It's, you know, life or death situations. Every day is different. Every call is different. In essence, insurance is a low down version of that where every day is different, especially for some particular fields like claims like myself. Every day is going to bring a new incident that's going to come up. Every opportunity to jump in, do something different because every situation is not going to be the same. So what I would say is, Yes, your entry-level jobs. Yes, your call centers. Yes, um, your mailroom positions may at first seem mundane and repetitive. But understand that that's where you start. That is the beginning of this wonderful journey that I've come to love as called insurance. That's terrific. And I can mirror that. So what I found, because I, I also um, have the CPCU designation, and what I learned during those courses, aside from all the other things that I learned, but what I learned was that really at its essence, the insurance industry does two things. The first is they make, it makes all economic investment possible. And the second thing it does is it helps people on their worst day. And so no part of the economy goes untouched by insurance and no person goes untouched by insurance. And I, I can't think of a more noble industry to be a part of. Just think about it. Risk is everywhere. Mm -hmm. It is in every interaction that we do. And just as the journey won't end, risk won't end. It's going to be a constant, I put it, good versus bad being that we're the front line in order to protect those from the monster we call risk in different shapes and forms in the financial market to the uh, the home owner to the renter uh, to the vehicle owner to that entrepreneur who's trying to upstart and do their own business there are risks present and it's us in the insurance field that help them navigate those risks absolutely so if somebody is maybe not familiar with the insurance industry and you know some of this conversation is it sounds like buzzwords and and it's not making a lot of sense where would you recommend someone start to learn about the opportunities and the um, rewards that come with being in the insurance industry? 
So, Amy, I don't know about you, but, you, you know, both of us have had an opportunity to speak in Chicago recently uh, with Ga Gamma Iota Sigma. I had no idea that fraternal organization existed, uh, an organization dedicated to those that have some interest in the risk management field. So if that's something, if you're a college student inclined, I would certainly tell you to reach out to them. Um, an ongoing resource for me as a professional, as well as when I was in my academia, uh, was the CPCU Society. Uh, it's a society not intended just for those that hold the designation, but for those with any interest uh, in insurance itself or risk management. Um, they have a plethora of information available. Uh, however, the best source, and this is my own bias speaking, uh, would be the ever-growing insurance nerds. Um, I hooked up with them a few years back when they were just in their infancy, a couple that, you know, felt that something needed to change in the industry to make sure that it was uh, sustained and ongoing, especially in coming in the new generations, given that on its outward appearance is not the most attractive of industries. Uh, and they've come through fold time and time again. Um, there are some collaborations coming down the line involving myself. So, you know, so my own self plug uh, with them. Um, but yes, that is someone just wants, even just a lay person looking for more information on insurance and, wants a straightforward way to understand it, it's a great reference to go. That's fantastic. And they're at insnerds.com. Um, and I'll make sure to link to those in the, um, to all of these organizations um, in the article or the show notes, if this becomes a show. Um, <laughs> so what are some organizations that exist specifically for people of color in the insurance industry? Insurance has a, a reputation, if you don't mind my saying so, of being um, stale, pale, and male. So the, the leaders in the insurance industry, um, the people that are front and center in the industry tend to be older white men. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily paint a welcoming picture for young professionals, particularly young professionals of color, uh, who might be interested otherwise in the industry. What resources are available to people of color who are maybe new to the industry or who maybe have been here a little while and, and don't feel like they found their place? So your stigma and the perception is very true. It is still an industry heavily dominated um, because it's an industry in which most operations were transferred from one fam within the family. So it would be the one father who was an agent transferred to their son, and predominantly that was of the Caucasian nature. So most organizations are still built upon that basis. And me as a professional, I'm still struggling interfacing in that. And, and I'm a sad to report that I don't have immediate references that I can provide um, other than if you find other people of color within the industry to speak with them. There's okay. been opportunities where I've spoken with other individuals of color just to start my own internal network with people that it may be more forthcoming as far as understanding of my situation when I present it. Um, again, networking events such as the insurance nurse conferences. I just recently attended a CPC breakfast meeting. I met outstanding individuals from Temple University. Um, we, the honestly part, when you're, when you're a person of color, you gravitate towards people of color. And an industry that can be seen as dominated by the Caucasian, it makes it difficult because mm -hmm. there's not many opportunity but in the same way you have to be a champion and be able to try to break through that barrier so yes it's unfortunate that there's not a, a resource that i'm immediately able to say this is where you go but in the same hand you have to see it as a benefit that it's sort of good that there's not because there's not that segregation between both sides yes it's a struggle for those coming through it but individuals such as myself and other leaders are trying to do our best to give a face of color to this industry to be a readable resource. And that's why you see me everywhere I can be. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any really platform that Dr. Tarman or Lazy Not Lazy shows up somewhere because that's the reality. 15 minutes a day, If it, what I do is have one person that says, here's somebody I can reach out to and just talk and ask you know, what they think is one extra resource someone has in this industry. I love that. And I know that INS Nerds has been, um, you know, a big proponent of diversity in the industry. They, they've been phenomenally supportive of my work. Um, the CPCU Society has a diversity and inclusion committee. 
uh, that works on this issue year round. And I think they're gonna be a bigger part of the strategic planning for the CPCU society as a whole, which I think will be really good um, in terms of attracting and retaining diverse talent in the insurance industry. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned your tagline, and I was wondering if you could tell me what you mean by it and how does it drive your work? And I, I am going to just bow out of trying to pronounce it <laughs> because I will screw it up. <laughs> sure. So it's a combination. Of, it came from my doctoral work um, and also being that it focused on millennials and being a millennial myself. Um, what I found is the most effective leadership at retaining millennials, given their entrepreneurial nature, was laissez-faire leadership. Um, so that's that the mean? first. Laissez-faire is, is, goes back to economics, meaning that hands off, let the market do what it's going to do. In essence, hands off millennials. Let's not micromanage. Let's not hover parent. Let's not feel that we need to hold them by the hand, as the misconception is. And not lazy, because a common misconception with millennials is that they're lazy. They don't want to invest the time, effort, and money as those that their predecessors did. So it's sort of an, an anthem to what the most effective way to lead millennials is, is also a motto for millennials looking to, as they become the biggest part of the generation moving in 2020, want to be led. So it's a twofold aspect um, coming from both directions. So lazy, not lazy. Lazy, not lazy. I love that. And I think, you know, it is important. And I, I think that most people don't want to be micromanaged. And most people will do great work uh, when they feel supported, included, and trusted. Absolutely. It's that accountability portion, which mm -hmm. is big for millennials. It's being held accountable for your own actions, taking those bumps and bruises, as I mentioned, when you develop your toolbox. Yes, mm -hmm. you will stumble. Yes, you will fall. Um, and if someone continues there to catch you and hold your hand, which most people believe they need to be, you don't learn from it. And, and then you're just taken away from someone's resources rather than not. So the biggest component is that most business organizations, corporate world are based still on hierarchical structures. It's the assembly line mentality that there's A, B, C, and D. And they're having the greatest disruption with millennials because millennials don't see linear like that. They see it as, if I can do Y to get back to J, to go to T, to S, and still get the same goal, I've essentially cut out all those letters in between. Right. And, and it's a disruptive because they're like, well, you didn't put the widget to the screw, to the door, to the hinge, to the window, to the mechanism. Mm -hmm. You're like, no, I built you the car in five days versus what it would take in 10. Right. So it's a disruptor. Like, well, that means me. I'm obsolete because I'm still doing this archaic method. But at the same hand, millennials need to take ownership and understand that that's that difference. It's, mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a struggle between both sides because just as it is with ethnicity, the same it is with the tenacity with electric, uh, electronics. Mm -hmm. It's the sa same kind of segregation. There's the, there's the side that's very well adept, majority of your millennials, now your Z years that are coming up, and then those are not. And it's the same kind of battle, find a unison where they both can work in collaboration to move forward. Excellent. So you alerted, alluded to this earlier, but I'm going to circle back on it. I know you're doing some additional academic research, and I heard a rumor that you're also working on a book that's not academic necessarily in nature, not for an academic audience. Can you tell me a little bit about those projects? Sure. So there's, as you said, a couple of things going on. I do have my doctoral work currently. I collaborated with another doctor. Um, we're looking to be, have it published in a peer-reviewed journal as in academia. That is a high esteem honor to have other doctors in your field say, yes, you know the topic that you're talking about, going again to working to be that expert. And that particular one is regards to downsizing, which we see predominantly now with most brick-and-mortar institutions with the closing possibly of Sears, with Toys R Us that recently closed. Um, and the retention of millennials because they play twofold. There's the downsizing aspect for the maneuvers that those in that traditions have done and the retention of millennials, which I focus on. Um, now the upcoming scene soon is the reflective thinker. It's a volume that's going to be dedicated to generations, which is leading the different spectrum of generation, uh, generational differences in our workforce. And I am focusing again on my millennials and my lazy, not lazy tagline. You will be seeing it that work. Um, and aside from that, I'm also working on, as many will see it once they look into me, um, the graphic 
development of my work into because as many will know when they know me is I am big into comic books. So I feel that they give the best vessel to make things the simplest way communication wise is, is nothing more than illustrations because anybody can understand in any language. Um, so this, I, that is a side project that I'm working to bring that to fruition as well. So you're writing a graphic. So I have the two articles. Okay. And then I'm working on a graphical a graphic novel in essence to say it can consist of both the literature plus it's almost a, a combination of a literature book and a comic book came together and made some glorious union that happens to be about insurance and millennials. <laughs> so you're creating a new genre of literature that is the graphic nonfiction novel. Pretty much. That's a good way to look at it. I love it. Graphic nonfiction. Okay. And so I was going to ask you about superhero comics and who are some of your favorite characters and what do you, what do you take away from their, from their story arc or from their, um, from their journey? Sure. So that goes to a little my backstory. So growing up, uh, as I said, single mother, um, I also had a half brother who, cause my mother, after having me got married to my stepfather who happens to be Austrian. So you have myself, primarily of color. And then my brother who looked more, um, Caucasian. So there was always that parody and comic books it did a lot for me. One, it was an escape because when you're a child and you see the disparity, especially during the early 80s, 90s, between the two different, you know, like my brother would be treated differently than I would be treated. And it depended on which side of the family because my mother's side was Hispanic. They frowned upon the relationship with my stepfather. My stepfather's side was Caucasian. They frowned on the relationship with my mother. So there was just always constant struggle uh, between what side of the family, what holiday it was, wherever interactions with social groups we were in depending on the dynamics because my brother would be awkward for any kind that were of the Hispanic nature for myself would be any regards to my, my father's white side. Um, so escapes one were uh, comic books because here are graphic novels in which there's generally a down and out or less than popular character who somehow is endowed with special ability, develops a special skill and re- Regardless of how they were downtrodden and brought like the society pressure on them, they still turn and help their other man. They still step up to put themselves in danger for the preservation of others. Um, it was also happened to be my very first job. Um, um, I was avid fan of comics. Um, household was not very rich, so getting comics books was seen as an extra. Um, so. In order to find a way to get my comics, I made a deal with the local comic book store owner and said, you know, I can come in, I can sweep floors, I can do odds and ends. All they would ask is if I could, you know, trade that labor in for, because being a kid, you can't get paid um, for comic books. And the guy was more than inclined and I still have those today, uh, still in plastic. It's just a reminder of, you know, here I am now working towards a goal, which was these escapes in graphical form. And then, to answer your question, so the two top tier favorites obviously are the Hulk. We have Bruce Banner, uh, mild in nature, scientist, nerd, trying to you know perfect mankind, gets hit with gamma radiation, has this alter ego, um, the Hulk, which is you know indestructible, uh, just feasts on aggression, and you know it comes to the aid of Bruce in the event that he's in danger. So there's this, this innate protection that's always going on. And as you see, when we're in person, my the other side of that is the flash. Here it is. Someone, um, same situation. We have, you know, there's been very many different versions of each character. Um, but Barry Allen of the flash is the one I particular attention most because his saga starts that he is the CSI. He gets, you know, bombarded by, uh, the forces he has the strike uh, speed force excuse me uh, he comes to the aid and his saga actually ends with him sacrificing himself for the betterment of everyone so his mantra is that he comes to the aid super fast but he's not you know he's not held back by the fear that he might give his life for what he's really pursuing to protect others so those are the two that always come to mind. Um, I always laugh at the flash because I myself I'm not very inclined to be very fast so there's that <laughs> always. This, you know, there's always that want to go much faster, especially when it comes to literature, because if you ever see the Flash read books, it's amazing. It's just flipping the pages and absorbing all that information um, 
it's just really available. And obviously for the Hulk, it's this giant muscle bound can lift a car kind of person who doesn't want that kind of strength. And if this you know, side effect is just being green, I think I could live with that. <laughs> so it's a blessing and a curse. Exactly. I got it. I love it. So I would like to ask you to finish the following sentence for me, if you would. Uh, and it is, I feel included when. Ooh, that's a tough one. I like it. I feel included when. Hmm, you've actually stumped me. And oh, I'm a talker. That's good. I'm so sorry. No, that is, that is excellent. Okay, well, I want you to think about it and get back to me, and I'll ask you a different question. Okay. Which is worded slightly differently. When I feel included, I... My value, my opinion is valued. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, so you feel included when your opinion is valued. Mm -hmm. And when you feel included, what are you capable of? What, do you, what does that look like for you or feel like? I carry the flag into battle. Oh, I love that. So for someone to get the best of you, value your opinion, and then let you lead the charge. Exactly. I love it. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's not very often that I get tongue-tied, and that was beautiful. <laughs> well, you know, it's an, important, it's an important question. And I try not to give people too much of a heads up on it because I really want it to be like – Genuine? Yeah. Yes. I don't want you to put too much thought into it. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. Dr. Mark Charman, thank you so much for your time today. Um, this has been, it's been fun. It's been interesting. It's been educational. And I wish you every success on your graphic novel, nonfiction work, on your peer-reviewed articles, and on everything that's coming your way in the insurance industry and beyond. I, I think that you have just a remarkable trajectory ahead of you. And Amy, thank you and everyone behind you. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Thank you.